Hospital, Upper East Side of Manhattan. And when I finished my fellowship at Temple University in Philadelphia, I came to Orlando, and that was almost 20 years ago. I've been at the same hospital, same practice ever since. And I was trained to be an invasive cardiologist, and I'm also board certified in heart failure and transplant cardiology. And also, of course, long-term cardiology care, including end-of-life discussion too. So it's a full spectrum. I love cardiology. First of all, it has a lot of different aspects. You can talk about the prevention. There's a mechanical correction of the pathology, such as changing the valve, doing bypass, opening the artery by angioplasty and putting a stent. And they are medication directly dilate the arteries. They are controlling the hormonal system. The autonomic system will be better balanced. Uh, they are lipid management. You can change the cholesterol and also you have to watch the potassium, magnesium, the electrolytes because they affect the uh, arrhythmia, electricity issue. Uh, there's a plumbing issue. The artery also just like a tree, they have multiple branches and you have to tailor each patient's treatment according to that area that's affected, not just looking at one branch, but also if this area is helped by other branches too. So you really have to have a global view of the health of heart. And also heart is just a part of the whole cardiovascular system. Now the artery is going to the brain, your eyeball to the tip of your fingers and your toes. A systemic approach is very important when you have acute occlusion causing heart attack or ischemic legs. You open the artery so that you can save muscle and save limbs, but also long-term management so that you don't have blockages elsewhere. You focus in the acute management of one branch, but also you need to have a global view of how to prevent the same process happening in other area of this vast system. That kind of discussion can be time consuming because patients often get very impressed by the acute improvement of the symptom when they're in crisis but before crisis occur or after they recover from the emotional shock they may not remember the long-term management that part needs a lot of outpatient education and i love this job is because whenever you educate one patient not only you improve this person's health but also hopefully this person can be a source of this area of information for their loved ones, family and friends. And often I finish my work face-to-face -face evaluation with my patients. Perhaps I see 30 patients a day. At the end of the day, at nighttime, call the patient and their family members. Of course, I will get the consent from the patient first before talking to their family members because there are many elderly patients in Florida. Their children are living out of state and they want to get the up-to-date information of their elderly family member. But also, some of them may not have health insurance themselves. So by the phone call or conference call, they may have questions, not just directly about the patient. Of course, I answer those questions as a general information. I would say I'm not your doctor and this is a general approach. I feel that I can help like cascade, reverse cascade or cascade down with multiple family members. I gain tremendous satisfaction on this aspect of the healthcare. And also, if you are interested in the social aspect of the healthcare, that's a very interesting, especially in this pandemic time, and you would see it's even more important for healthcare people to participate in the discussion. And the more of us open up and talk about important subjects with humility, we know that there are a lot of things we don't understand yet, we should have rooms for minority opinions. Otherwise, the society will become, especially in this canceling culture, people self-censored. They're so afraid of putting their opinion out there. That actually leads to more tribalism. People will dig deeper into their trenches and just draw stick figures of people who have different opinions and, and just not helpful for finding out solutions. That's why I think this is a great opportunity for me to not just talk about cardiology, but anything related to healthcare that can do outside of the patient's room to reduce suffering. Suffering is such a big topic, not just physical. There are things that's worse than death. And just like a pendulum, they always swing and there's no firm line of dividing 
right or wrong. I think this is really the process of dynamic discussion. We just need to be open-minded. And you are so young, and I think that you're interested in medicine enough to come to have discussion tonight, but also I'm afraid that the fears or sometimes antagonistic public shaming style of discussion over the past one year, a lot of them originated from fear have led to a lot of discouragement and perhaps many talented, motivated individuals decided to stay away from medicine. So if you are one of those people who are interested in the science but are afraid of the political part of the medicine, I, I want to have a conversation with you about that too because I, I know physicians need to have a, a louder voice on this, not just to comply to the mainstream views. And there are, of course, there are hard science that's not up for discussion. We all know that the earth is round and it's not because I am afraid of being punished, but I, I really know this is the truth. But there are things that, especially pandemic, public health issue, a lot of things we still don't know, then we should not attach morality into scientific discussion. Anyway, so that's my monologue. If you have any particular question, just bring it up. Thank you so much for sharing this. Oh, I, I'm so glad your father is doing well. This journey has made the family stronger because a lot of times when facing danger, fear would bring up anger and alienation or blaming other people. You're right, heart failure, especially with LVAT, left ventricular assist device, is such a team sport. You have the whole family who need to be devoted to taking care of, um, making sure the battery is not drained and you cannot travel that far to go, go to the wilderness without outlet. You and your family are a great team. Thank you. Wow. And congratulations also for having a father who are fortunate enough to have a heart that's donated by someone who's loving or family member who's loving enough to donate. I'm sure you're an advocate of donation. You will be a great doctor with this experience and with this insight. Thank you. Yeah, that actually brings up a very important topic of family is a the, the most important healing environment for a patient. And medicine is just a, such a small part of um, health improvement. The family and the society, childhood, nutrition, education, and that is why even though doctors try not to be a political figure, actually medicine is the combination of social science and natural science. And in terms of justice, you would get a little bit wider view to talk about the other area of medicine to bring about social justice and especially public health. Obesity is one of the very important public health issues. 40% of the Americans are overweight and that also tied to the COVID mortality and morbidity too. It's so great that you and your family are successful in losing weight and I think in this uh, pandemic it's even more so important for everyone to, to understand that your own immune system is the key to fend off M&M, &M, mortality and morbidity from the infection. I mean, if there's infection fatality rate, there's IFR, there's a case fatality rate. For traditionally, we always talk about CFR, case fatality rate. If someone is sick and the percentage of person dying from this illness is this number, but this is very unusual we start to talk about IFR infection mortality rate and traditionally we never really test everybody's flu status or if anybody's infected with the common coronavirus the common cold and then determine the risk of dying and now we're doing that for COVID so that has a very strong implication of how we tailor our behavior to to protect ourselves but not deepening other existential anguish and I think a lot of the conflicts now is really a marker for people's fear. That is the really the time for people with medical knowledge or passion about healthcare having an open discussion not just always told the mainstream line.
I'm happy that you bring up the from transplant a very very high tech resource limited about a six five thousand heart available per year. But when you talk about the prevention and the public health obesity prevention, yeah, you'll be a great doctor because you place importance in that area already, not just the the most shiny technology, the highest, the, the most glorious advances of medicine, but the basic stuff. Because that's really, I think the social determinant of healthcare reflects on that too, the obesity prevention, childhood education. Right now we're just using high tech to try to catch up of the inadequacy we have done in public health. But I think this pandemic has taught us this, that um, we need a better infrastructure of public health, we need a better coverage of healthcare, but um, whenever you talk about universal healthcare, you have to be open-minded or willing to talk about rationing or resource allocation, otherwise there's no, just think about organ transplant, it's always wonderful to have the organ and change your life, but there are plenty of people who are not able to make it to the list. They may be enlisted, but later on they they die before they get the organ or because the standard is so stringent because of the, the solid organ availability is so limited we have to make the standard so stringent and that means the majority of the people with severe heart problem that could benefit from transplant could not get it but they are not angry at being rejected they, they know it's a pool of um, the, the donated heart but in terms of use the same mindset to healthcare economy, there's such a huge waste in the healthcare. Um, when I was at Lenox Hill, I was so young. I was 26, starting my residency, and at that time, there was no limit of 80 hours per week uh, work. Not yet. ICU is usually the, the longest work hour and I remember the most is two part of the Lennox Hill three years of my life that is the ICU rotation seeing the very sick patient also challenging my limit of physical stamina. The second part is the, the AIDS floor because that was 1995 there were not a lot of uh, effective cocktail yet so I have seen plenty of young vibrant people die from this nowadays can be treated as chronic disease but in those days in their 20s 30s prime of their lives they die that two part of the rotation really stand out of the whole Lennox Hill experience of course that was long ago 1995 in medicine once you finish your training you find your life suddenly be Becoming very different in terms of how much help you are able to get. There are a whole team of once you are attending, there are a whole team of people who do many things that in the past as a resident you have to do it yourself. So you can really focus on clinical decision making. But the downside is that you don't get that much of uh, interaction, direct interaction, especially at nighttime when things change. There are younger doctors. Um, a house officers who would house the staff, we still call them house staff. Long time ago without beeper, without cell phone, they, they live in the hospital. They can call me at home and fill me in. The visual, the direct observation when things change, you, you don't see that much as when you're younger. So the impact, the emotional impact is less. And of course you can take care of bigger number of patients because there are other team member to help you out. Uh, so it's very hard to compare life as an attending, especially cardiology attending, to internal medicine residency training. And in those days, you thought that was normal, that you had to do everything yourself. You don't see that as extra burden. I was just very happy that you, you can be there when people need you. But when you're exhausted, you will think that, why do I get into this field? Probably it will never get better, but actually it gets better. Once you, you are attending, it gets so much better. Because like I said, you have so much help from other team members. So very hard for me to do a direct comparison. Of course, my stamina is different. I was in my 20s, now in my 50s. Personal life continues to happen when you're 
going through your training and starting to look for a job, changing location, you start to have family, and it's a woman physician. If you have children, I don't believe any mother would feel complete satisfaction of of their role of being a mother. There's uh, doesn't matter you're full time, stay home mom. That's even harder a job, or you work in a busy time-consuming field as medicine and being a mom. It's always a balancing act, but it's great. And my son is a residency too. <laughs> so it's a very rewarding. When I was at Lenox Hill in the 1990s, it's a different environment. I think people are, uh, because there, there was no social media and most of the discussions are face-to-face -face plus when you know someone, uh, treating different opinions would be a lot more friendly because you know that person's temperament, you know that person's usual decision-making framework instead of just grasping one different opinion and fight to death. Like on social media now, you can have a very strong conviction to your own view without really reading in depth or hearing other people's explanation because they don't have the time to explain to you you don't have the patience to hear them but when you know someone when you're in the workplace sitting together uh, because on call a lot of times residents and interns are having dinners at the cafeteria together sometimes attendings if they get called at night they have nowhere to go if they have to wait for OR uh, getting ready uh, then they will sit with us. Uh, they are less concerned about saying the wrong thing or harassment. That's what I miss about 90s. Uh, yeah, social media is great that you have a lot more exposure to different ideas compared to when I was 26. But the limitation is that people are not willing to talk as much when they argue. <laughs> That's not a way to exchange ideas. So what I would say is that if I were you at this time starting my training, starting my medical education, I would read as much as non-medical book as possible. If you read people have opposite opinion as you, not only you learn and grow from expanding your knowledge, but also once you see the logics, you will make a more effective argument when you try to change their mind or you may never change their mind but at least you plant a seed example is when I as a cardiology oftentimes I talk about prevention and you can only mention so much about cigarette smoking cessation because that's such a common sense if you as a physician they they spend the money they spend the time to come to see you you turn that into a education about that general health sometimes they think that's a Rating and they think that you are criticizing or judging them because they, they think that I know already why, why do you need to mention that again and again? So I usually just use it as an opportunity to explain how smoking can increase the inflammation of the endothelial cells and that can promote osteosclerosis or if the plaque may be more vulnerable and prone to rupture I can go through those details so that they understand why is this so important if people are just saying that I will never take statin, no matter how much you say, because it's, I'm not trying to belittle you, but Dr. Sen, I think that everything you read already has a financial interest behind it. You may not know it. I don't want to say you're brainwashed, but really you are only exposed to such a narrow possibility of health science. You would not understand my standpoint, but I'm telling you, I would not do what you tell me to do. And if someone is already having a bypass surgery, already have heart attacks, and already have stents in their legs, stroke, very high cholesterol number, you know you're watching another event happening and you feel so demoralized, not only because you can't win the argument, but also you, you're not able to be a good advocate if you're not able to change their behavior, behavior including taking the medication that's prescribed. A lot of doctors don't want to be exposed to this moral injury day in and day out. Um, they would tell the patient, I cannot see you because you don't trust me. But I'm afraid that they will be completely turned off and to the next doctor. 
They may even just lie and say, I cannot tolerate this medication. Eight different statins, all of them will have side effect. They can just say, I'm tired. I'm just excessively fatigued and that's not good. I'd rather keep the channel of conversation open. I would try to explain, but at the same time, I would read on why they are so against certain medication. Just like anti-vaxxers, I would go on their website to read about that. In that way, when you talk to them, you have sweet spots to attack them, not really to, um, to defeat them, but to help them by letting them know that their logic has flaw too. And please hear me out. At the end, if they really are against doing what I wanted them to do, I would have to admit it may be my limitation of communication skill. I just say that um, because of the barrier of the communication, it could be my part that I may not be able to explain well enough to you. Perhaps you should just seek a second opinion for your own sake. But anytime you want to come back, you would make me very happy that you, you still trust me and come back uh, to continue care with me. So no one would feel abandoned. In 1990s, people didn't have such a strong uh, conspiracy theory against some healthcare advice. But now with the internet, they can read everything. And the thing is that when you shame them, they, they will turn underground. They will get into the platform that you don't know what they're talking about. When a crisis like pandemic happened, all of those undercurrent accumulated over the past 20 years when people change a lot of communication from face-to-face -face discussion to online. The most vocal people are the two extreme. And when economic crisis along with pandemic occur like this, because pandemic is never only about disease, but it's about every aspect of livelihood and uh, social fabric and, and what it means to be a human being, not just staying alive. And when things like this happen, you would see the breakdown of communication even more. In the past, I always thought that elderly patients often don't want to approach this subject. In fact, it's the opposite. A lot of the elderly, they know their end is near. Maybe not one year, maybe two years, but still they are willing to have this discussion. It's their family members who don't want to discuss. And from talking to them over the phone at nighttime when the elderly patient is still not in critical condition, not sick, not in the hospital setting, but at the clinic setting, of course that takes extra time from my personal life. I feel that I understand the family dynamic better. And that helps me to treat, use my privilege as a healthcare person at the last part of their life journey, help the whole family become more adhesive rather than divisive. When people are sad, they are so much grief or regret. They are very complex. Emotions can come up when a person, when a loved one is dying. It will become a huge psychological burden and sometimes that burden will turn into antagonistic relationship with their siblings or other family members and I don't want that to become part of the end of life experience for the elderly because they can see, they can see the, the argument, they can read their family members even if they, they pretend a smiley face when they visit. I feel that if I have this privilege to improve their quality of life including the existential comfort in addition to the physical health I should start early. That is also part of the reason I started the conversation early on, using the routine clinic follow-up as opportunity to have a conversation with a family member. Traditionally, of course, you are only responsible for one person, one patient in front of you. I think that should be expanded to include more people. Family is one of the examples. Yes, it is challenging when you spend more and more time in typing notes. Even if you have a dictaphone, you are the one organizing the notes. In the old days, yes, sometimes you think a doctor's note is so sketchy, but it's all essential information. Perhaps the handwriting is terrible, but when you're used to reading medicine, no problem. 
now you can have four pages of electronic medical record, the important information is buried inside, it's even harder to find, reducing a lot of effectiveness of communication. Teaching includes not just teaching the younger doctors or nurses, but also family members, like I mentioned, because they are the team, they are the background, they are the smallest community, the nuclear community that can help a person to heal. So I often would share my notes with a family member so that they can read the reasoning of my decision making. During the spring, there was so much fear. We don't know what's going on and it's understandable that there's a lockdown of the society community, but also canceling of the elective procedure. Different specialty, not just healthcare people have different anguish threshold toward COVID compared to non-medical people. But inside of medicine, different specialty have different trigger point too. If you are ICU or respiratory therapist, pulmonologist, infectious disease hospitalist or ER, you see more very, very sick COVID patients. So fearful of the crashing of the system, so we have to cancel the elective procedures. But now, we all know it causes more problem in terms of delaying seeking healthcare, such as heart attack would come in when people have a very large sized heart muscle that's already dead instead of having a early symptom so we can put a stand there to prevent a sizable heart attack. Now we see complications from massive heart attack such as papillary muscle rupture or ventricular septal defect from MI. My sister's oncologist, she's seen people who delay their chemo or delay their screening. Pediatrics, I have friends who are pediatrician, they have seen injuries from child abuse number reduced because a lot of kids are not going to school, they, they don't get reported. But when they are caught by the healthcare system, those kids are sicker. Psychologists, of course, they've seen more depression, anxiety. Public health officials, they see more suicide and more substance abuse. So all of that are the consequence of trying to prevent death from COVID, but they are other form of human suffering. And that's why I think it's very important for us to have the communication line that is open among academics. Now, I think academics are not having that permissive environment. It's always easy to say that lives are valuable. Uh, every lives are important. Of course, if you are the deontology ethicist, you would say that there are things that's right in and of itself. You don't look at consequences. There's the right thing to do and lives is important. That's it, end of discussion. But if you're utilitarian, you would say we need to look at the net good, doing the most good to the largest number of people. Then you need to prioritize things and you do not view ration as a toxic word. You need to have that kind of open-mindedness and permit minority views. And now there's no such a environment. You see on public square, you only see well-known people day in and day out repeating the same thing. And when they run out of things to say, they just keep repeating how many cases and how many people died. But there's so much talent in the society that needs to be tapped into, but they don't want to speak out. When you lock down, when you isolate, a lot of my elderly patients who are living in assisted living facility or nursing home, so isolated for more than six months. I feel that as their advocate, I have to say something. Of course, in public health, in a transmissible disease, you cannot say, you calculate your risk-benefit ratio. You made such decision of participating in a very important family gathering or 85 years old, you want to risk it and see your great-grandchild for the first time. But what about other members in your assisted living facility? Because it's transmittable disease. So it's a difficult discussion. That is true. I'm just thinking out loud. If you think of any social movement, you need spectacles, you, you need a visual signal that we are in it together. When you're all isolating, you don't get that signal. You're suffering in isolation. And of course, you don't want people to gather, but if just imagining an urban planner would use a lot of empty parking lots, rapid testing, I mean, early on, we only focus on the very high sensitive PCR test that would take several days to come back. 
and when you get the result, you already have a few days spreading the virus if you're positive. It's not the best test to change behavior. Diagnostic test needs to be very sensitive, but the test that used for public health to change behavior, you may not need that very sensitive test because if you have a test that's not sensitive but pick up the people who have the highest viral load, those are the people who spread the most. The low viral load people, even if they have PCR positive, they may not be the source of uh, transmission that much. If you have a very crude, fast result, many talents should right away get together in the spring and say, let's just open a new allowance for that kind of uh, rapid test, not sensitive, but pick up the most heavy viral load people in empty parking lots, get small business a chance to do this kind of work. And the liability reform needs to be done quickly in this aspect. People cannot be locked up that long. They, they really want to the right to work, that kind of protest. They are not crazy. It's just expression of their anguish. If we started early by finding out the heaviest uh, viral load and they know the result right away, stay at home, then you don't need to close the school. And now, of course, closing the school is the biggest injustice to the social economically underserved population. You, you think you're trying to protect them, but they are the ones who do not have the resources to work from home. I have middle-aged patients who were in their prime of their career, lost their job and no insurance, um, and they have to stop some of the medications. I'm able to see the elderly patient's home environment, virtual visit. I see the most is the anguish of the isolation. They, they, they really miss their, their family members, especially if they're already in a nursing home. Usually weekends are the happiest time um, their family members come, and now they're only a virtual FaceTime. In the past, I thought it was impossible for a 90-year-old to, to learn how to do this. I thought it was only telephone. They right away learn about technology, enable me to do the virtual visit, but also let me witness with my own eyes how much suffering of this um, isolation is causing people. And that's the elderly patient population. They are not seen by public. The public thinking that we are protecting them. There's such a narrative of um, like a generational war um, in order to protect the very elderly. We sacrifice them, the working population, not allowing them to work, give them a check to still have something to eat. National debt is higher than told to our next generation. As a cardiologist who have many patients who've been seeing me for more than 10 years, I've seen them from their age of 70, very smart, very sharp, to their 90 now. They really rely more and more on the family connection because a lot of their friends are already dead. Now you take that away, and let alone some patients die alone at the hospital, um, I think that's worse than death itself when in your dying moment you cannot see your family member and it's a lifetime trauma to a family member too. So we need to reflect on many things we've done because this is not going to be the last pandemic. Hopefully in my lifetime there won't be another one but in the future historians will look back at this time and think that why do we miss so many opportunities in such a uh, country that's full of vitality and innovative society would suddenly no one dared to bring up solutions. There are very well-written articles that don't get published. Scientifically, peer review is a great way. You have experts who make sure the quality or the research method is right. There's no fraud before you publish. But the same group of people may share the same view that may not be correct, but they are the ones deciding what opinion get to be published. Clinic care, outpatient care is such a different world compared to a hospital. Hospital, you have a very short term relationship with the patient. Of course, you are very important at their sickest moment, but you may not know their family background. But as a clinic doctor, if you know them for a long time, then you know little nuances, how much social support and how much their cognitive function can handle the complexity of the management. Many times when patient, there are multiple options 
offered their patient doctor shared decision making, it's good that you emphasize shared decision making as opposed to paternalistic uh, approach of uh, patient doctor relationship. But when you go to the other extreme, just like a pendulum, you, you go to merely offering different options, like reciting uh, different treatment possibility to a patient and family member. You document, I, I discuss pros and cons of this and the patient will get back to me. They may never get back to you because they're so confused. Legally, you feel that you're so protected. First of all, ethically, you feel that you do your job because you let them make the decision. Legally, you also protect yourself because you make all the documentation that you give them the option. But in reality, many times that's uh, too overwhelming to the patient. On the other hand, when you ask me, what would you do then? I will always emphasize, I would always remind them that everybody's value system is different. It's all about risk and benefit. It's about trade-off, how much disability you're willing to take in order to prolong life. I have a patient who, when he was very healthy, he, he said that there's no way uh, I could live because he was an outdoor person, like hunting and, and fishing. He said there was no way if I could not go out to do what I love to do, such as fishing and, and camping. But then he has diabetes and he had a history of smoking, even though he stopped smoking. Now he has diabetic ischemic leg so severe, the infection was so bad that angioplasty of putting a stent into the leg and the leg bypass surgery cannot salvage. He lost his leg a few years later. He was not very uh, careful with his glucose control. So the vascular disease is so extensive, eventually he lost both legs. And then at that moment, he said, Actually, even if I can just watch football, eat my ice cream, I'll be very happy. So people have a very different expectation at different stages of their lives. I remind my patient that I'm not you. And also there are different reasons for people who want to hang on longer. They may want to, their, the goal is only to see their grandchildren graduating from high school. They say, I just want two more months. I know it's end of life, nothing can really significantly prolong my life and continuing living like this is actually a lot of suffering, but I'm willing to take that suffering because I wanted to see my grandkid graduating. So these kind of discussion and decision making are very common in outpatient setting, uh, whereas in the inpatient you take care of acute issue, because nowadays it's not like a century ago hospitals where you stay till you're completely recovered. Now it's acute care and the, most of the recovery is at home. Even open heart surgery, you stay in the hospital five days to seven days if no complication and then you go home for physical therapy at home. When my attending told me in 1990s, he said when I was at your age in 1950s, we, um, there's no angioplasty, there's no statin, there's no thrombolysis. We treat heart attack just by holding their hands and we spend a lot of times when patients are at the hospital because they stay bed rest for a long time. They didn't know the early activity is very important. In those days, they stay in bed for a month to three months and the house officers really stay at the hospital and live in the hospital because there was no sleeper um, and they get to spend a lot of times with the patients. So the patient load is not as heavy, but uh, they spend more time with each patient. No matter how technology evolves the patient doctor relationship the most sacred i think is still you spend time to, to get to know the person sometimes when you conquer the disease you does not gain that much quality of life for the person but with the modern technology if patient and families are willing and if they demand a very frail person can still have very complicated surgery that may render them disabled for a long time and they may still eventually die because of advanced age. On the other hand, if you have with patient, you have to trust a good doctor-patient relationship, they will listen to the conservative approach with a deeper understanding that is the best in terms of quality of life. I have to say, first of all, different specialty have different intellectual appeal. When you only know one area, you can say tons of good things about this area, 
um, not because other areas are less interesting or less rewarding, just because I don't know enough. Uh, cardiology is rewarding to me in my field. Right now, my position is including outpatient care. That allows me to have a 20 years relationship with my patients and their families. Well, even just one year relationship, that's rewarding if you think that you provide the best, not just healthcare, but also um, support in other area in the human life. Because like I said, death is not the worst. Also, there's a high tech component in cardiology. The changes in the approaches of revascularization, that means uh, opening in the artery. The defibrillator is so smart now. In the past, every time you avoid death is by a very, very painful, sometimes cause um, post-traumatic syndrome, kind of shocking. And now you can avoid death many times by those painless anti-tachy pacing. And only when the algorithm runs to the last step, the device will shock you. And often when you have the routine device check every three months, you would detect those painless ATP sessions, then you know how to adjust the medication or um, figure out the etiology of this frequent ventricular tachycardia. LVAT, the earlier your, your classmate had mentioned, his father had a left ventricular assist device before the transplant. So all of that are very exciting. Um, I'm sure other specialties have their excitement of uh, technology. The long-term relationship part is really, really rewarding, but there are plenty of specialty that do not have that long-term follow-up. Say if you're a trauma surgeon, if you are a transplant surgeon, they derive excitement or reward from different area, of course, the immediate recovery of the patient. Whereas in long-term follow-up, you may not see that immediate improvement. They may never happen because everybody is destined to die. Aging is a cruel process. You gradually lose your capacity, your, your different functionality, and it's not something you can prevent or stop, or you can try your best to slow down. If you cannot, then you still are at the position to help them to cope better and help their family relationship better. And that I get my, a lot of my reward from. So that, that makes me love cardiology. In addition to what I mentioned that there's electricity, which is the, the EKG, the arrhythmia part, there's a plumbing part. When I do heart cath, I'm just amazed by the beauty of the, the artery. And sometimes when you swing the camera, because it's a 3D pipe, uh, if there's a cholesterol plaque that's causing narrowing, in one aspect, it may look white. And when you swing the camera, you will see a very narrow slit and you will say, wow, that's amazing. Earlier, I thought that was healthy part. Now look how ugly. And you will appreciate the dynamic, the, the 3D uh, component of this plumbing system. And there's a pumping, there's a heart muscle strength. That is not just a muscle, but also involves the, the papillary uh, attachment to the mitral valve and the, the geometric relationship with the size of the left atrium. All of that are intriguing to me. So I, there's acute care, there's a chronic outpatient, long-term follow-up. There is a plumbing, electricity, and the pumping. There's a high tech, and there's a medication discussion and non-pharmacologic intervention, NPI.